so who is this guy? Hello, everyone. My name is Eric, and I work for a company called Shipstud. Anybody ever heard of Shipstud? OK, I can guess where you work <laughs> or in what region of the world. Um, Shipstead is a company from Norway, very active in the Nordics, uh, sort of in certain parts of Europe as well. I myself am based in Barcelona. Uh, they also have some brands that they operate in Latin America. But most of the time in the US, nobody's familiar with this company. You can think of it as a media and internet marketplaces company. But it's not really that important for the topic that I'm going to discuss today. So to put myself into perspective, I run the global Tableau server for this company. We have about uh, 8,000 people globally. Around 3,000 people are using the server. Not a huge deployment, not a tiny deployment. We run it in AWS since day one. And before I joined Shipstead, I actually worked for Tableau. I was based in London, and I spent almost four years uh, working in pre-sales, which means that I went to many customers and help them get started and also scale Tableau Server. And then a lot of what I saw was people struggling with certain things that I'm going to discuss today, like how do you automate a deployment? How do you successfully monitor a Tableau Server to make sure that you're aware of what's happening? Uh, how do you do certain uh, automation tasks around the server, et cetera? So hopefully what I'm going to do today is give you some of the knowledge which I've gained since joining Shipstead and which I saw customers struggle with when I worked at Tableau. Uh, all right, so let's get started, but before we do that, Siri, set a timer for 40 minutes. All right, always makes me feel like MacGyver. Okay, if you looked at the talk title today, you will have seen DevOps sort of prominently displayed and if you search DevOps, you'll see this was the only talk that mentioned DevOps. So I, I'm not too sure how many people are familiar with DevOps. Hands up if you're sort of familiar with the term. OK, we're about 50-50 split. Uh, DevOps is kind of a buzzword. It means different things to different people. But the root of the term is development plus operations. And the whole idea is that this is kind of a methodology or a mindset or a culture which allows you to quicker uh, deploy products to your customers and allows you to also monitor how your customers use this product so you can create a life cycle and get more value to your customer and so your business can be more successful. If you want to know a little bit more about uh, the DevOps ethos, I recommend you read uh, this article by Amazon. It's very good. It sort of positions why DevOps which is very important. A lot of people say, what is DevOps? But I think an important question is to ask is, why even worry about this DevOps thing? Today, I'm going to focus on two things, which is automation and monitoring. The DevOps goes into many, many other different things. But I think automation is really important, because when we are deploying a Tableau server, we always want to deploy it in the same fashion. We want it not to matter who deploys the server and we want the result always to be the same, right? And then monitoring is really important because we want to know at all times what is the status of the server and do we need to do anything about it. Um, and at a very high level today, these are the topics that I want to discuss. If you have any questions during the talk, please just wait until the end. We'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. I'm going to mention some of the AWS services as well. I'll try to keep this uh, I'll try to stay away from acronyms as much as I can. Um, I'll try to define them each time I, I mention them, but probably since we're dealing with sort of uh, cloudy stuff today, a couple of acronyms will slip in. But if, there's, if I mention anything that you don't know what it is, just ask me in the, the questions. I'll be happy to uh, clarify. So today, I want to discuss what I think are key topics. So security, how to do upgrades to Tableau Server, how to monitor, how to create backups. Backups are super important and also how, an example of how I do certain automations around Tableau Server. All right, so first, first things first, I'm a paranoid Swede. I love security. I think, actually, we should all love security because if we think about what Tableau Server is, it is a window into our data, right? Uh, I don't know how many people here are uh, operating outside of the US, but in Europe, there's this thing called GDPR. GDPR has not hit anybody with a hammer yet, but 
if you play fast and loose with your data, GDPR can definitely come and nuke your business. So we want to be very careful with who we allow to see our data and how they access that data. So security is really, really, really key. And this kind of thing scares me. I don't know how many people have seen this, but this is a Tableau server out in the wild, which you can access via a URL. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are, you just type www. I'm not gonna point out which company this server belongs to, but it is something that you should never ever see, right? You should not type tableau.company.com and see a publicly exposed Tableau server, ever. That's just a bad idea for several reasons. One, if you're using local authentication, such as this, where you put a username and a password, Tableau's server doesn't have any rate limiting built into it, so I can just sit there and guess all day long what the user and what the password might be, right? We all start admin, admin, user, user, blah, blah, blah. Um, but basically, Tableau doesn't have a built-in system to uh, stop you from doing that. If you're a server admin, you need to put security in front of Tableau server to make sure people can't do this. The second thing that uh, you want to avoid is, even if somebody guesses all day long but they don't get the password right, if they are a little smart and they build some sort of a script to do it, they can actually um, write, like create a denial of service uh, on your server. If you get too many people connecting and trying to guess credentials, they can bring the server down. So you want to avoid that as well, right? And I think uh, most importantly, I think the next slide is really big and it's gonna take a second to load. There we go, okay. Uh, most importantly, if people apply a little bit of uh, intelligence to this, uh, and it happens with other services on the internet, you can see them say, okay, here's a publicly exposed Tableau server, I'm going to go to LinkedIn, I'm going to figure out who at this company is involved in Tableau, because they probably have an account, then I'll go to, I'll guess the structure of their emails, so I can guess what their user is, then I'll go to a website like Have I Been Pwned, and see if that person has any passwords that have leaked from other sites. For example, uh, Dropbox or LinkedIn have been hacked and you have uh, user credentials and passwords. And a lot of people, unfortunately, today reuse their passwords. And so if I know what your LinkedIn password is and you also have an account on your local Tableau server, it's possible that it's the same, right? You don't even want to give people this uh, possibility. So you wanna be really careful with security and uh, in conclusion, that is not fine, so you want to avoid people being able to uh, directly access your login page for Tableau Server. And this sort of takes us into the AWS world. Um, just out of interest, how many people are running in AWS? I'm guessing a lot of you, given the talk title. Okay, awesome. Um, if you look up AWS Quick Start for Tableau, you'll find a template which the brightest minds at Amazon and the brightest minds at Tableau have got together and created, and it's basically a best practice deployment, which you get completely for free, of Tableau Server in AWS. You get this uh, CloudFormation document, you run it, and it generates infrastructure for you, and it generates what you see here on the screen and a little bit that's below the screen that you can't see, but we'll, we'll cover it in a second. Um, basically, it's going to create a a uh, distributed, distributed deployment, if that's what you want. But more importantly, you can see in the middle section, there's a uh, elastic load balancer. And the way that uh, Tableau is uh, deployed in AWS using this quick, uh, quick start template is you don't directly access Tableau server. Anybody that wants to access Tableau server is routed through an elastic load balancer, and that elastic load balancer then ferries them on to Tableau server itself which allows you to do a lot of intelligent things around who's able to access the Elastic Load Balancer. In this case, you can apply a security group, which is like an asset-specific firewall in AWS. You can say, I only want IP addresses in the following ranges to be able to access my Elastic Load Balancer. Thereby, if the uh, traffic is not coming from one of the uh, ranges in your list, they don't get through to Tableau Server. So this is a really nice way of adding security in front of Tableau Server and then making sure that you're not hitting these kind of issues where you just have a globally exposed server because that's a really nice way to get, give everybody that needs access access. You really wanna lock down access to only the traffic that you trust. 
and not let anybody else in. If you look also at this quick start, you'll notice something that when I first heard of this, I thought it sounded like a really ridiculous thing, but it's actually quite useful. Um, you'll, re you'll recognize that they added something called a bastion host. Some people also talk about this as a jump host. Basically, the idea is that while end users only need to get to the GUI and log in, Tableau server admins actually need to access the underlying machine, right? You need to go to the virtual machine where Tableau server is installed, and you might need to install a driver, you might need to do whatever, right? You need access to the machine. But you never want to have direct access to the machine, because that means that the, tab the Tableau server is accessible publicly, right? If you look at this diagram, you'll see Tableau servers in the private subnet, meaning there's no direct internet access to Tableau server, whereas the Bastion host is in the public subnet, meaning that you have direct internet access to the Bastion host, and what you do is, I, with my laptop, for example, if I'm running Tableau Server in Windows, I will RDP into the Bastion host, and then from the Bastion host, I will RDP into Tableau Server. So it's, it's a little like Inception, because we're running like a computer within a computer, and it feels a little ridiculous, but from a security standpoint, it's actually best practice, because what, what happens is the Bastion host is really, really simple. It serves one purpose. Its purpose is to ferry me through to Tableau Server whereas Tableau Server is a really complicated thing, right? You need to have all these ports open, it needs to have connectivity to your databases, blah, 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 blah. Whereas the Bastion host, it just does one thing. So you can lock down that machine and harden it and make sure that it's almost, nothing is unhackable, but you can make it as, as hard to hack as possible, and you just use that machine to then jump into your production server. If you look at any quick start uh, that AWS makes available, you'll see uh, Bastion or Jump Host sort of sprinkled all over the place. It's a very good security practice, and I really recommend you don't make your Tableau server publicly available for anything, right? You always want to lock it down, control your security. Uh, you can also use another service in AWS called uh, Systems Manager, which allows you to remotely control machines most people seem to prefer the, uh, the Bastion or Jump Host way, but just know that you have options and that you probably want to pick one of these options. Right, you never, you never want to have a Tableau server in your DMZ, just a bad idea. All right, so if we uh, take a look at that uh, quick start that I just mentioned and we sort of zoom out, this is what the Tableau deployment that I look after looks like, sort of an uh, abstracted 10,000 foot view but what you can see here is um, in the, the gray area is our Tableau server, and then it connects to the data all over our business. We mainly use Redshift as a data warehouse, but we have data that streams in from our users all over the place. Uh, Shipstat has about 30 million daily active users. We stream data using uh, Kinesis and Kafka into uh, S3. And then we have that uh, uh, data in flat files, and then it's ETL'd into Redshift. We've also started using something called Amazon Athena. Would anybody using Amazon Athena? Okay, awesome. It's a really nice serverless uh, way of querying your data. So the data we have in Redshift, we know its business value, we know why we store it, we know what we want to do with it. But if we look at our, uh, our raw data, sometimes there's something you want to look at, and you don't know if it has business value. And you don't necessarily want to load it into a database, start querying it to find out if you need to ETL it into your data warehouse. You can use something like Amazon Athena, where you pay per query to do exploratory data analysis. And if you see that that data has value, then you can think of what you want to do with it in a more structured manner. But it's, it's been really nice. It's allowed us to very quickly sort of get an idea of our data before we decide what we want to do with it. Uh, Tableau Server also connects to on-premise legacy databases, like probably all of us have legacy databases lying around. We use IPsec tunnels. Uh, there's a, our, our cluster is really simple. It's just a two-cluster deployment, uh, or two-node deployment, and we have a worker machine that's basically just generating extracts, mainly to our data that sits in these um, older databases that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily quick enough to deal with uh, uh, on-demand uh, queries. If we look at what sits in front of Tableau, 
you'll see it's similar to what I just discussed. We have a, our users access Tableau via a, a identity management tool called Okta. And what's really nice about that is no Tableau user at Shipstead actually knows what their login is. They don't know what their password is. They go to Okta, they identify with Okta. If Okta trusts them and confirms their identity, then they get ferried through to the Elastic Load Balancer, and the Elastic Load Balancer checks, are you coming from a Shipstead network, or are you connected to the Shipstead uh, VPN? And if you are, then you're allowed through. So we have like a double check. And what's really nice with nobody knowing what their password is, is nobody can lose their password because nobody knows what it is, right? So that's a security risk that we avoid as well. Um, Okta is, can be turned on by a, a tablet server SAML settings, so it's just one of many IDPs you can use. But it's really nice in that there's one less thing to worry about with your end users. So going back to the quick start, the deployment that I just showed you was built using the quick start, but then of course we did a lot of changes and the deployment that we currently have isn't the exact deployment you'll get if you do an out of the box deployment. So most of the time you'll start with the quick start, but you'll end up making it your own. But I really recommend starting there because you're getting a, a industry certified like best practice deployment that you can then tweak. And what's nice is if you screw something up, you can start over and you'll get the same industry standard best practice deployment. How many people are using CloudFormation? Awesome. When you first see CloudFormation, it's kind of scary. It's basically an enormous JSON or YAML file that defines all of your infrastructure. And a lot of the time, you'll find that it takes a while to learn CloudFormation, and you, you don't necessarily see the value immediately. But I recommend anybody that's sort of looking at it to take the time, sit down, learn it, because it gives there's so many wins from having your infrastructure defined as code. One really nice thing is I have a CloudFormation document. I deploy it today. I get some some Tableau deployment. If my coworker deploys it tomorrow, they get exactly the same result. So there's no, it doesn't matter who does the deployment, you know what the result's going to be. Another really nice thing is, since it's all code, you can version control it, you can check it into Git, you can see how it evolves. If you just look at your AWS console and look at the infrastructure you have and, and the assets you have, it's going to be very difficult to say, okay, we added this thing at that point because of this reason, you lose touch with the evolution of your infrastructure. Whereas if you have everything in defined as code, it's much easier to track what changed, why did it change, when did it change, et cetera. So CloudFormation, just a really, really nice way to control your infrastructure. All right, this takes us to um, what I think is a really interesting way of using CloudFormation when you apply it to a Tableau deployment. So as you've seen today, Tableau is updating its uh, software quite frequently, right? We get about one release per quarter, which means that as Tableau server admins, we are doing a lot of work to update the deployment which our users are using, right? And if you read the official Tableau documentation, they recommend uh, create a test cluster, run the update there, see if it works. If it works, run it in production, right? You should be freaking out at this point because, uh, again, as a paranoid Swede, run it in production, just it kind of doesn't work for me. And so what I recommend is uh, doing something called blue-green deployment, which allows you basically to create a copy of your infrastructure running the same software but the upgraded version and then you test it, you see if it works, and if it does, you just reroute the traffic from the old deployment to the new deployment. So I'll take you through the steps now. So if we look at a very simplified version of that deployment that I showed you previously, here we have our two node Tableau server cluster, and let's say it's running 2018.2. 
Okay, everyone's happy, the users are accessing it via Okta, people are seeing and understanding their data, things are good. But now there's a new release, and we want to make it available to our users. What do we do? Okay, the first thing you do is, using CloudFormation, you deploy a new cluster. But in this case, it's really simple. It's not as complicated as the quick start that we saw before. All you're doing is deploying two virtual machines with the, it's basically going to be identical to the previous deployment, but the software version is going to be the newer one. You have to define the disks, so we're going to pick some EBS or elastic uh, block storage disks, and you're going to apply some security groups, but they're probably going to be exactly the same as previously, right? And, and that's it. So you use CloudFormation, you deploy into your Amazon network or your VPC this new uh, cluster, and once that's done, the next step is to run a TSM uh, backup of your current deployment. And here it's a little tricky because Tableau Server also contains a database inside of it. So the only thing we need to do is we need to tell everybody that uses Tableau Desktop or is creating visualizations, hey, uh, give us like a 30 minute window to move to the new server. If you publish anything after the backup to the old server, it won't appear on the new server. So just uh, give us 30 minutes. You don't need to tell the users anything because they're not going to notice. They're not creating content, they're just consuming content, right? So the users are none the wiser, but anybody that's creating content, you don't want to have them publish something and then see it disappear. It's very confusing, so you would tell them. But basically you run a TSM backup, that takes, depending on the size of your server, half an hour, an hour, whatever time, and then you push it to Amazon uh, S3, which is like Dropbox, but in AWS. And once that's been done, you then download the TSBAC file to uh, the primary on the new deployment, and then you run a restore, TSM restore, and you get, at this point, two deployments of Tableau Server that have the same content. The only difference is one is running the new version of the software and one is running the old version of the software. And the next thing you do is you just route the traffic from the Elastic Load Balancer to the new deployment, right? And so what's, what's gonna happen now is people are going to click on the Tableau icon in Okta, and they're just going to be routed through to the new Tableau server. They're going to see the same content, and in fact, some users won't even notice that it's the new version of Tableau server. They've had zero downtime, and if anything goes wrong at any point with the new deployment, you can always switch the Elastic Load Balancer to the old one, and so you always have a backup, right? If you're running a upgrade in deployment, an update in, in, uh, in production, and something goes wrong, your production server is, is uh, gone, right? And you need to rebuild everything, which probably means that your users are going to have a longer outage than expected. With blue-green deployment, what's really nice is you always have something to fall back, fall back to. The worst thing that can happen is that the new deployment doesn't work, and people will have to live with the old one for while you try to figure out why the new one didn't work. But at no point are you risking everything. Right, so paranoid suite and me really likes this. If there's, if you confirm that everything works and you're happy with this deployment, then the next step is just to destroy the old one, right? And there's this idea in uh, sort of the cloud infrastructure world that you should treat your servers like cattle, not like pets, right? So when the old deployment is not useful anymore, we just destroy those machines, and in fact, if we need to make any changes, we should just run CloudFormation again and redeploy everything and destroy the old thing. We should never, for example, let's say that in this scenario, I didn't deploy Tableau Server on a disk that's big enough, and I need to change the disk, maybe add 100 gigs. And the, the DevOps way to do that would be to change the CloudFormation script, make the disks bigger in the script, deploy it again, and destroy the old cluster, not to go in and manually change anything. It seems like overkill, but once you get used to this way of working, 
you'll see it has a lot of benefits. One of the reasons why you don't want to do that is it's really easy to forget the manual changes you've made. And then if you need to redeploy the server, maybe you forget that you had to upgrade the size of the disk, and then you run into the same problem again. Right? As humans, we're very forgetful. Right? But if we put everything in code, it's very hard to forget. It's just defined. And in fact, when you run the CloudFormation script, you're confirming that the, the code you've written is correct, right? You're seeing the, the deployment, and you can validate if it's correct or not. So that's blue-green uh, deployment. I think really interesting for Tableau Server. I don't think many people are doing this, but I think that it allows you to have a smaller blast radius and less risk when you're running an update. And now that Tableau is going to be pushing updates each quarter, we're going to be doing a lot of updates, or at least our users are going to ask us to be doing a lot of updates. So if we do something in that fashion, we have less risk, there's less downtime for the end users, and we can probably sleep better at night, right? Which is, which is nice, I like sleeping. Okay, monitoring. The next thing that is really, really important in the Tableau server world is is Tableau Server accessible? What's the status? Is it running fine, et cetera, et cetera? Probably the most important thing that I monitor when you look at the current deployment is the connectivity between the Elastic Load Balancer and Tableau Server. If the Elastic Load Balancer loses touch with Tableau Server, it means that none of my users can get to Tableau Server, which means Tableau Server is completely down to them. And so what I do is I monitor the connectivity between the ELB and Tableau Server. And I use a service called CloudWatch. Many of you are probably familiar with CloudWatch, but I have a hook into a service called SNS. And this is gonna be like an acronym jungle here. But uh, SNS stands for Simple Notification Service, and it basically just makes it easy for you to push a message out via email, or even better, via SMS. And for those of you that haven't been to Europe, SMS is like just a text notification on the phone. So what happens in my case is if Tableau server ever loses touch with the ELB, I get an email, but I also get a message to my phone saying, hey, the, there's an alarm that just went off. You probably want to check what happened. So for example, each, uh, each weekend at 5 a.m. I do, on Saturday, I do a restart of Tableau Server, just because it's like a good maintenance practice to do that, and I get a message saying Tableau's down, and then an uh, hour later I get a message saying Tableau's up, and Saturday morning when I wake up, I make sure that I have both of those messages, and if I do, then I go about my weekend uh, in a happy way, otherwise I check what went wrong. Um, but what's really nice is you can have an alarm set on an asset or set on something you have in AWS, and you can have those messages pushed out. CloudWatch is really simple to use, and it makes it, it, makes it so that we, there's very little work for us to do in order to monitor the important things around Tableau Server. If you're running a deployment on-premise and you need to have your own monitoring software, it can get really complicated. But what's nice in AWS is it's just a service that's built in and it's very easy to, to apply to your Tableau server deployment. So in general, there's a lot of things you should be monitoring. I think these are probably the most important or they have been the most important to me. Uh, so of course we wanna, we wanna check the connectivity between uh, the Elastic Load Balancer and Tableau server, but we also want to make sure that we have enough disk space, right? Disk space is super important. If we run low on it, we're in for a world of pain. Um, what I recommend is just set a CloudWatch alarm on your disk and make sure that during the week you're not running dangerously low. For example, for my deployment, I'm usually running with a lot of free disk space, except for on Saturdays when I run the backup and I create like a 30 gig file, I want to make sure that when I create that 30 gig file, I'm not running dangerously low, right? Because if the file doesn't fit on disk, then I don't get my backup. And then I don't have something to fall back on in case everything goes really, really bad. Another thing is, depending on what kind of disks you attach to your EC2 machine, you might need to worry about something called IOPS or not. 
I run on disks called GP2. They are uh, like uh, general SSD disks. They're probably good for most people, or good enough for most people. But what happens is uh, AWS gives you a certain amount of read and write on those disks, and they give you like a quota. And, and you could get like a PhD in IOPS. But what's important to know is if you run out of IOPS, they'll slowly replenish over time. But if Tableau server is not able to read or write to disk, you're going to have a catastrophic failure. So you always want to monitor basically your, your IOPS quota. And CloudWatch allows you to do that in a very simple way. And so what I do is I look over the period of a week, have I ever been dangerously low on IOPS? And in general, for my deployment, it's not that bad. The only time I get even close to having a problem is when I uh, create my backup, because I'm writing like a 30 gig file to disk, and that's consuming a lot of my uh, write operations. But other than that, just be aware that if you're running on something like GP2, you should probably monitor IOPS. Uh, monitoring RAM is really important as well, but unfortunately in uh, CloudWatch is really, really hard. And so you probably want to use a different service in order to, ma to monitor RAM. Uh, you can use Tabmon, which is Tableau's uh, sort of native solution to RAM monitorization or monitoring anything around Tableau server, really. Or you can just use the tools in your OS. So if you're running on Windows, for example, you're probably using the, the inbuilt uh, monitoring. Or if you're running in uh, Linux, you can use something like uh, HTOP or something like that, right? Um, Another side note here is if you're constantly running at a really high utilization of CPU or RAM, you might want to consider upgrading your EC2 instance. So basically what Tableau recommends is if you're between 75 or 85 percent utilization for long periods of time, maybe at this, I would say like for many hours or days, consider adding more RAM or more CPU. Obviously, depends on CPU depends on your license. RAM's a little easier. Because um, you want to make sure that Tableau has enough resources to do what it needs. If you are dangerously low on resources, you'll have trouble with all kinds of things. So just, ma just uh, monitor that. It's really easy to change the uh, EC2 type. So if you need to, just know you can. All right. Another thing I do is I like to have sort of set it and forget it solutions. So for backups, I have each weekend Tableau server generate a backup file for me, which I store in S3, just in case I need it. Most of the time I don't even need it, but it's nice to know that it's there, just, just in case. A lot of people use um, like EC2 snapshots, so they take a snapshot of the VM and they use that as a backup solution. That's fine, it'll work. Uh, those of you that have worked with other um, VM softwares will know that, you, that that generally works. However, if you happen to take a snapshot of your VM when Tableau server is in a corrupted state, that snapshot's not gonna be good for anything because if you roll back to it, you're just rolling back to another corrupted version of Tableau uh, server. So the official supported way of creating a backup is by using the inbuilt Tableau tool, so you're using TSM backup, for example, right? And I've set it to run once weekly. On the weekend, I do some maintenance scripts, and I use something called CloudWatch rule to do that. Uh, a CloudWatch rule is similar to Windows Task Scheduler or a cron job in Linux, which basically you just say, at a certain time, I want a certain thing to happen. What's nice with using CloudWatch is it's not dependent on the machine where you've installed Tableau Server, right? So I know that whatever happens, as long as, a as AWS is functioning correctly, I'm going to have this task run. And what, what I do is I have CloudWatch invoke something called SSM, which is um, basically just a tool for managing machines. It's, uh, it's called Systems Manager. And it can run a command on my Tableau Server. And so I have, a, I have a batch file on Tableau server get, that gets called by this uh, um, SSM, and it basically just does a TSM backup. It pushes that TS back file to S3. It does a verification 
to see if, the, if it's a valid backup or not, and then it deletes the file from disk because I don't want all these files to uh, grow on my disk. I want them to be deleted as soon as I'm sure that they're correct. And that pushes it to S3, and because I'm in Europe and GDPR is a big thing over there, I just put a policy on my bucket that after 30 days, the, the file is deleted. So I don't have files. I, I don't really need a backup from six months ago anyway, right? But the last 30 days is really useful to have. So I know at any point in time, I probably have four backups I can uh, refer to or use if I need to. Another thing that I do is just around general maintenance. This will be different for all servers out there, but I have specific business logic that, for example, requires me to uh, output a list of users on Tableau Server. Right? Uh, the finance department at Shipstead wants to know who's using Tableau Server, and so I create a list of the users and then I push that into a CSV file and I make that available for the finance department. And the way I do this is, again, I use CloudWatch, really nice way to say at what point in time I want this uh, job to run. And then I use a service called Lambda. Lambda is sort of like the hottest new hipster thing to do in the cloud. Anybody heard of Lambda? Okay, just, just note serverless. Um, it's actually really nice. If you want to have, if you have like a snippet of code that you need to run, what AWS does is they take that code and they worry about how to run it, how to scale it, how to make sure that it can be run, et cetera. So the idea behind serverless is for you, all you manage is code. And AWS manages the machines that that code is run on. They manage the high availability of that code, meaning that if there are problems in one availability zone, it doesn't matter because they'll make it uh, highly available. They worry about scaling. So for me, it's really simple. I basically run tiny snippets of code uh, you know, single times per day. But if you need to run it hundreds or thousands of times, it's not a problem. AWS will just scale that for you. And what's really nice is you don't pay for when you're not using it. So you only pay when you're using it. Whereas the other way of doing this would be either I install Python on Tableau Server, which is something I don't want to do, right? Paranoid Swede. And I can install Python on another machine and have that machine communicate with Tableau Server, but then at that point I need to worry about two machines and I need to worry about patching two machines and I need to, it sort of becomes a, a, a security issue at that point. And what's nice about Lambda is I just put my code in Lambda and AWS takes care of everything else, right? And what my code does is it uses something called a Tableau Server Client, which is a really nice Python library, kind of an abstraction built on top of the Tableau Server REST API, which allows me to do um, interact with the information within Tableau Server. So it's really easy for me to get a list of users, and since I'm in uh, Python, it's really easy for me to output that as a CSV file and then have that CSV file written to uh, S3 and then my finance people, I just give them a link, and I say, anytime you click this link, you'll get the uh, current day's list of users of Tableau Server. And then I, I put some policy on that S3 bucket to make sure that only certain people from certain IPs can access that file. And that, that allows me to kind of create this workflow once and then have it always function, which is really nice. Uh, there are many, many, many uses for Lambda. This is probably not the best one, but it, it was really nice for this specific use case. All right, so if we kind of uh, take a step back and we look at the points that I've discussed, we can see how we can apply sort of a DevOps mentality to Tableau Server. I think security kind of speaks for itself, right? We want to have a totally secure server that's completely locked down only to the IP ranges that uh, should be accessing it and only to the people within those IP ranges that should be accessing the server. Again, our Tableau server is like uh, where all of our data is, so we should be really careful with controlling who accesses it. And who accesses it. Uh, also with upgrades and updates, now that updates are going to be sort of uh, coming at us in an aggressive fashion, we want to be really good 
and really structured in how we update Tableau server. If we do it manually today, maybe we get away with it, but I promise you, if you manually update Tableau server, at some point, you'll have an issue, right? Or maybe at some point you won't be there and somebody else will have to do it for you and it'll make you very nervous and you may, might not have such a great vacation, et cetera, right? Just if you have an automated way of doing it, it's going to remove a human error and it's going to probably be a good thing for everybody. Monitoring, we should be monitoring Tableau server anyway, but what's really nice is that in AWS, we have a very easy way of monitoring the important things, and there's a very easy way for us to get information about the things that we're monitoring if anything happens to go wrong. Also, backups, we, just, we should just expect to have backups, and if we automate that process, we have something to fall back to in case something goes uh, horrifically wrong. Finally, if we need to do any sort of uh, minor uh, automation of the Tableau server, we can use tools like Lambda to run code and get uh, information off the server if we need it. And I think that there's a lot more to look at, but if you're not familiar with uh, some of these AWS services or you're considering AWS is a possible place to deploy Tableau Server, take a look at the quick start. It's really what I would recommend people start with if, they're, uh, if they haven't really started their uh, AWS uh, side quest. And then if you're already running in AWS, take a look at maybe uh, blue-green deployment, which I think is uh, quite an interesting way of working with CloudFormation. Uh, and that my friends, is pretty much it. Uh, Siri is telling me I'm done. So, uh, again, as everybody at the entire conference has told you, please leave feedback. Feedback is welcome. We learn from your feedback. So, thumbs up, thumbs down, doesn't matter. Just leave it. It's good to know. Finally, if you want any of the information, I didn't want to put all the links in all the slides and have it look like some ridiculous mess. Uh, if you're interested, I have a list of links that I'm happy to share, so you can uh, contact me. They go sort of in, in, in levels of importance, so right. if you contact me on Twitter, I'll probably send you a Pokemon. But uh, I think we have some time for questions. I also know that this room is extremely far from the rest of the universe, so if you want to get going and head to your next session, that's fine, but I'm happy to take questions as well. Uh, and finally, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Okay. I, do, do we have a mic for questions? Or are we just, okay. Should I? I'll get it. Oh. Thank you. Who had? The, I'll start here and then we'll pass it back. Uh, the single sign on for Tableau on AWS. Uh, single sign-on, no, so at the, at the moment we use Okta, but let me, let me take this and I'll put it here and then we'll be ready. Uh, at the moment we use Okta, which is basically a, a SAML solution, but a single sign-on also lets you sidestep the issue of users knowing what their password is, right? Single sign-on is you go to Tableau Server and you're automatically in, you don't need to worry about what's your username, what's your password. But I currently don't use that. No, I have people log into Okta, which is sort of a, a layer above. So what we have is Okta holds like all of our business tools and basically if you want to get anything done, you need to log into Okta and then Okta gives you access to Workday, Tableau Server, Jira, Confluence, GitHub, et cetera. Next question. Um, is there a version one cloud formation template that we could get from the quick start which will install the server for a specific version, let's say 2018.2.3, uh, and do those basic things for you. So we could just download it, run an initial instance on AWS and see, okay, this is working, and now I can start customizing it to my needs and do additional uh, steps as needed. Yeah, so basically the, the quick start will install all of the infrastructure that you need 
So it basically says you go from nothing to a Tableau deployment. It can either be a single node deployment, so just one EC2 machine, or it can be a distributed uh, installation with three nodes. Um, and the quick start will basically do that. What you need to give it is what's the installer you want to run. You need to give it your um, license key. You need to give it some basic information. You need to say who the software is going to be registered to. But it's actually really, really slick. It will auto install the software for you after it creates the EC2 machine. It's super nice. And just a side shoot. Uh, like we could do start a trial on the server side. Does the template allow us to start a trial? I don't know if the template allows you. I'm guessing it does. Uh, I would have to check. Uh, I'm, I already have a license, so I never installed the, the trial. Well, we haven't moved to the cloud fully yet, but I'm thinking okay. I don't want to put a corporate key out on the Yeah, I, the I'd cloud. say probably Tableau can help you test the quick start. It's in everybody's interest. Anybody else have a question? There's some, should we run, I'll run the mic over if we, and get some exercise here. All right, where's the next question? Here we go. And then just pass it over to you. All right, thanks. So our Tableau server, we've also got a lot of other kind of add-on software, things like Control M for scheduling and things like that. So it, is CloudFormation in a blue-green deployment able to be configured to install all those extra pieces and configurations? Yep, so currently, you can basically get as granular as you want. I've seen deployments where everything is taken care of. I've seen other deployments where you just have Tableau server, the software installed, but then you have to go in and manually install the drivers, for example. Mm -hmm. But you can automate the installation of drivers. You can automate basically whatever you want to add to that EC2 machine. It's just you'll have to do it. You'll have to add that logic. But yeah, you can say, I want to install Tableau Server, then after Tableau Server is installed, I have these uh, drivers in this S3 bucket, download the installers, install them, then I want to install this other software, et cetera. Okay. Who was next? You? This guy. <coughs> yeah, I was just gonna ask about, um, when you guys are doing these deployments, like the blue-green deployments you mentioned, how do you uh, deal with uh, session management as you're cutting over to the newly deployed? With uh, uh, SSM? Uh, yeah. So you would need to have an SSM agent on the machine that uh, CloudFormation creates. So you need to make sure you're either using a uh, AMI that has SSM, an SSM agent already there, or you need to add the SSM agent as a part of your CloudFormation script. Uh, totally depends. You look, certain uh, AMIs don't have the SSM agent pre-installed. Okay. So you just I would say what's really nice about CloudFormation is you basically go to the CloudFormation part in the console, you can just drop the script there, and you can run the deployment, and it'll create all of the infrastructure for you, and then you can test it. And if something goes wrong, or if you say, oh, I should have created a 400 gig hard drive instead of a 200 gig hard drive, then there's, there's this button that lets you terminate the entire deployment, and then CloudFormation will just tear down the entire stack it just created. So it's really forgiving. If you make any mistake, you can just click that button and it'll just get rid of everything. Literally, you can have it create hundreds of things and then tear a hundred things down. So it's, it's really nice. It allows you, it's a little bit of work, but once you get used to it, it allows you to, to define things exactly as you want. All right, any other questions? Oh, it's like a cross room. Uh, here, I'll, I got it. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go back here and then over there. I know, yeah. There's no HA for me. So, quick question. So I was just curious if the template allowed uh, specifying how many VSQL servers you want to run, et cetera, based on your EC2 instance. Uh, not based on the EC2 instance, but you can actually, in the CloudFormation script, define how many instances of VSQL and backgrounders you want. And that's not a CloudFormation specific thing but the, I believe that the Tableau server installation is handled by a Python uh, file, and so you can define it in the uh, Python code that creates the Tableau server installation on the EC2 machine. So basically what you have is CloudFormation will first create the VM. Once the VM is done, it will then install Tableau server, and it uses 
this kind of convoluted Python uh, uh, file to do that. And so you can definitely say, I want four VizQLs, I want eight backgrounders, et cetera. You can define that at creation. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, another one up here. With the blue-green deployment, how yep. does it handle with reserved instances? Are we able to transfer that over? I know it's an AWS question, but yeah, yeah, with reserved yet. instances, um, how would that work? I believe I'm not. I, I would need to double Again, check. I haven't done it either. But so if you if it. you pay for a reserved instance and then you delete the old instance and you create a new one, I think that I'm would sure. apply. Again, I don't Any know AWS that. certified. As long as it's the same price or more expensive, or no, the same price, right? Yeah. There we go. Uh, do you know what the licensing requirements are for Tableau Server while you have those two server instances active at the same time? Oh, this is a, like a tricky lawyer question. <laughs> uh, so at no point do you have two production servers, right? Until you move, until you point the ELB at the new one, you're just, you just have a test instance. So I believe the way that the, the Tableau world would look at this is with any Tableau server deployment, you get three environments, one production and two whatevers, right? Usually it's testing and development or something like that. Or um, one of, I would just consider the cloud from the, the deployment that CloudFormation creates would just be like a dev environment until I point the ELB and the actual users hit. It can't be a production server if no users can get to it, right? I'd say, if in doubt, ask your Tableau server salespeople. They're probably better off answering that than I am. Another. Oh, I, I just have one thing about yep. uh, about the Bastion server you mentioned. Um, our Bastion servers are never on unless we need to log in, and they automatically shut down every evening. So sometimes it looks weird, like how is that really more secure? But it is more secure because it's never on, so nobody can ever get to yeah. it unless yeah. we manually turn it on. I think that, and then you're, you're cutting your attack surface uh, even more by doing that because you can't even get to the bastion that would get to the server, right? I think the, the general rule is you should never RDP or, you should never be able to RDP or SSH into your Tableau server directly. You should always have to go through something. That's kind of the golden rule. Oh, here, let's run the mic. Oh, there we go. You guys are better at this than I am. Uh, I didn't see any DR in your s structure, so what about the DR? In so, your in my case, the disaster recovery solution would be that automated backup that I have, and if something goes wrong, then I have cloud formation that can really quickly create an entire Tableau deployment if necessary. Uh, usually that's not necessary. Usually you'll have everything intact, but Tableau will be corrupted for some reason, and you can still use that EC2 machine. and of course, it's better if you have ye yesterday's backup, but for me, the worst case scenario is I lose six days, and one of those days is a Sunday, probably nobody's working, so worst case scenario, I lose a week's work. Not ideal, I could run backups every day, but because the server that I manage is global, I have people in different time zones, and I don't want to run a backup when I have people using the server, so I prefer to do it on the weekend. Globally, people respect the weekend. Like, do you have any thoughts on, like, if I were to do the DR, where, because of the need we have, we got, it's easy to create a DR in AWS, but, like, in the upgrade scenario, how is it going to work? Because now it's not a simply your load balancer going to new production, but DR also needs to be upgraded, right? So 
you have any thoughts on how that should kind of? I, I think if, if uptime is super important and you start thinking about DR a lot, then you might be wanting to move in like the, the HA direction. If you look at the quick start deployment for a distributed server, it's actually an HR solution or HA solution. Not HR, that's a different thing. Uh, it's a, it will allow you to have one machine go down and still have Tableau server available for your users. And it's actually really, really nice because they put each Tableau node in a different AZ, meaning that not only are you architecting for Tableau server high availability, but you're also architecting for Amazon's network. Uh, in case there's an outage in AZ1, you can still depend on the machines as running in AZ2 and AZ3, which is super nice. Oh, runner. Just curious, what version of Tableau you are? I'm on the dot uh, two release now. Eighteen dot two. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And it's uh, they're coming uh, fast and furious, so uh, I recommend. Uh, oh, I don't remember the exact rest of it, but dot two something, yeah. Do you have any experience between Pub and GloveCloud and also operating system difference as we're going towards Linux? Uh, you mean differences between Windows and, and Linux? With the uh, formation template. Yeah, so one thing you need to be really careful of is with uh, cloud formation, you need to define the AMI. And I believe there's somebody at Tableau working full time just updating the AMIs in the uh, quick start uh, cloud formation script because you can only use the AMIs that are available today, but of course, Windows Server 2016, for example, might get a security patch tomorrow. That, that AMI is not available today, and so you need to go find that AMI. So what I do is before I launch uh, cloud formation, I make sure that I'm using the most up-to-date AMIs, uh, and they're constantly changing. So you can use, um, there's a command called EC2 describe. I think you can get a list of AMIs available. And just be aware that they change depending on the region as well. So the Windows uh, 2016 AMI that I might be using isn't necessarily the same one. The, it's not gonna be the same AMI if we're in different regions. So they're region specific as well. So you need to look that up. Um, Bigger changes between Windows and Linux, that's, it's not a Tableau specific thing, it's more of like a uh, OS specific thing. There, there are uh, certain differences that are really big. I'm still running on Windows, I haven't switched over to Linux, but I think I will because Linux allows me to save so much money on licensing costs and kind of everything else that we're running in AWS is running on Linux, so that allows me to use some of the other tools that the business is already using. Uh, I think Tableau Server is one of the only Windows-based uh, pieces of software that we're running. We're in the same boat. Yeah, I think a lot of people okay. were. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions, anyone? What machine is that using? Uh, M44X Large. That's probably the jump-off point for anybody. That's sort of a general-purpose Tableau Server. It's got 16 vCPUs, maps to eight physical cores in case you have a uh, in case you've got your license by cores, it's kind of the minimum you can use. Other people use R instances. Uh, just depends on what your needs are. It depends on how much CPU and RAM you need. Um, main difference is really RAM. But um, there are some really great articles on people testing the different uh, types of EC2 instances. But M44X Large has been pretty good for us. Question in the back. Awesome. Okay, I don't think I've read that white paper. I got homework. What What would you recommend? Okay. Yeah. 
No. World of pain. Yeah. All right. Should we take one last question and then? Uh... So the, the primary is still a single point of failure. Is it possible to spread primary across multiple AZs and point the same load balancer to that? So you can architect Tableau to be uh, more highly available. My, in my case, ta Tableau is uh, nice to have for our business. If we have downtime, it's not the end of the world. So we have just a two node deployment, but of course we have single points of failure, um, basically one single point of failure. If the primary goes down, it's totally useless. Um, you could, but then you're looking more at a HA scenario. That's really the, the only solution you would have. If you go to HA, then you're not machine dependent for any single machine. You have two different machines, they run in two different uh, zones, and you've uh, basically architected that problem away. But then you also are in the different world of, um, you know, you're, you're paying a different license. So it depends on what it's worth to you, right? You can. You can pay for a solution that'll get rid of that problem. It just needs to make sense financially as well. Um, what's nice about, you can kind of do like a poor man's HA, where you have a, uh, like a dev cluster that is running the current backup that you have available. And if you ever have a, a Tableau cluster that fails, you can just send the traffic to that one. It's not instantaneous, it needs a little bit of, of work, but that's kind of like poor man's HA. Um, it can work pretty well, especially if you're not, you don't have Tableau server as like a customer facing product, if it's just used internally, and you can handle some downtime. That's not a bad way of doing it. You get that one for free. Thank you. No problem. All right, thank you everybody very much. Have a great time at the party.